All right, so at this point, um, we've gone through some of these uh, screens about uh, what, uh, what our quest is, our adventure quest. We're at the scene to start, and we go to help and all of that. So um, I'm going to, what's easier for me is to have my scene panel open. I like having that to jump from scene to scene. And you want to open up your actions panel, keyboard shortcut F9. So on this actions panel, it also shows us the various scenes where we do have some action script. So we need to work on the gate, the gate scene. All right, so we'll go to S0 gate. Uh, we've got already a stop action as usual that uh, once we get to this screen, uh, we don't progress from here. But what we'll need to do, most likely, you're going to have different music in different parts of the game. Definitely the title, probably the ending scene and such. So there's going to be some code we're going to see over and over, but just change it a little bit depending on the scene. One of the bits of code is the music. We've already set ourselves up to start to do music on uh, scene start. So we should be able to copy and paste that code and save ourselves some effort. So let's, let's go back to scene start. And we've got, let me zoom in here, we've got a chunk of code. Event listeners for when the game is paused and resumed and then function music activate and function music deactivate. So those, uh, those lines of code, we're just going to reuse them several times throughout the game. In my case, it's lines 12 to 25. If your lines don't line up exactly, that's fine. But you have to find the lines that say the native application event.activate down to the end of the function music deactivate those uh, 13 lines of code or so we're going to use them several times in different parts of the movie or the game to turn on or off music so I'm going to copy all of that instead of retyping it I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it into my gate scene and of course we need to change a few things here because we're in a different scene with different music so um, it's still going to be native application, blah, 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 event activate. But here now we're dealing with a different set of music. So when we, when we think about it that way, OK, the one that I copied from scene gate was simply called, I mean, scene start, it was called function music activate. But we're going to have different music soundtracks playing. So it'd be more efficient not more efficient, but uh, it would make more sense to have um, these functions have different names. Music, function music gate activate, function game over uh, deactivate, etc. So giving these some names. So I'm going to call this function music main activate. This is going to be the main music that plays throughout the game. So these two functions are dealing with activating and deactivating the main music. <coughs> Is that still in the gate? We're in the gate. We're still in gate. Yep, S0 gate. I'm not going to go back and change S start, although it would make a little more sense to go back and do that and maybe call it FN music start uh, activate and deactivate. So if we're saying once the game is activated, run this function, or once the game is deactivated, run that function, that means that we need to rewrite the function names on the next lines. And you can either write it or copy and paste it. So now that's function fn music main activate and function music main deactivate. Doing this copying and pasting saves me a lot of effort because I don't want to retype native application, dot native application, dot event listener, etc. And I don't want to forget to create my functions 
you know how we've forgotten perhaps event putting in a putting in what type of event in the function and putting in what type of return value so also just for uh, our notes here uh, music got activated main music got activated and main music got deactivated because we're gonna have music in the um, main part of the game and we're gonna have music in the um, game over screen and maybe a, a nice soundtrack in the uh, good ending and a bad soundtrack in the bad ending so each one of these should have its own its own names no music is gonna play yet We're, we'll get to that we'll have our coding work first and then we'll start to add the particular music for each particular scene. The gate scene is pretty simple. You're going to click the gate, you're going to go forward. This is going to be one of the scenes that um, kind of gets the user, the user used to simply, you might be able to click things, you might be able to click and drag things. So this is going to be a click. So um, the gate is, has not been turned into a symbol. We'll, um, we'll set that up in a moment. Uh, we'll set up, while we're here in the code, we'll set up the event handler. So we'll say, um, btn gate dot add event listener. with the usual parentheses in the event of some type of event, touch event, dot touch tap, run a function, fn go. After we click the gate, if we're in the gate scene, what's the next scene that we get to after the gate? Well, in my case, door. My front door is the next place I go to. So go um, S1 door. That will need a function definition. Now that's S1, not an L. Be very careful there. Scene 1, door, not SL, S1. And yeah, capital S, even though it's not capitalized in my scenes panel, simply because, uh, again, in between my letters, my words, I capitalize the letter. This function expects to be run when there is an event, and specifically a touch event. <coughs> now sometimes, um, I don't think people have mentioned it, but sometimes when you're writing the code and it pops up to give you a suggestion, if you click to, to follow the suggestion, sometimes it automatically also writes for you at the top in import. If it does, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's fine. So in my case, because I did allow the pop-up to finish writing the code for me, it also added another import. We already did those imports back on way, way back on frame one. I'm not sure why it would add it again on another scene, even though we've already activated that code before. So you can leave it, you can remove it, it's fine. I'm going to leave it just to show you there shouldn't be any issue. So it may happen sometimes when you let it auto-type uh, auto for you. Okay, so the idea is I'm going to tap the gate, and the gate will then take me to the door, scene one door. But the gate will also animate. It'll open up, it'll play a sound, it'll do more than one thing. So we can embed in a symbol its own timeline and having it do its own thing, having it uh, animate on its own, having it play a sound on its own, and so forth. So, 
at the moment we will say btn gate dot play So we can have the main timeline play, and we can have movie clips play. So that's what's going to happen here. Now this, of course, if I try to run it, it'll give us errors. So don't try to run it yet, because we don't have any symbols called um, VTN gate at the moment. Just make sure you've got that code, and then we'll work on the actual door. The door, uh, the gate that is, will need to be turned into a symbol, and then we can animate it. OK, so this, then, depending on how you drew your scene here, might be easy or not. But what we need to do is separate the gate from the rest of everything. So for me, it's not as easy as making a selection like this. You know, if I make a selection like that, this is grabbing the gate as well as a bunch of other lines outside of it. So technically, all of that would become a symbol. That may or may not be bad. It just depends how you, uh, how much you sort of, I don't know, how much you, you care about it. Because technically, a person if we turn this into a button, a symbol, a person can click on the gate right here in the corner, and that will trigger the the button to go forward. So in my case, because I kind of drew it freehand and it's tilted and all of that, it's not going to be a perfect selection with a square. We do have the lasso tool. Remember this little lasso? That's the one that you can use to draw a shape around or a selection around only the gate. Here I'm using the mouse, which I still miss. But here then now, I have more of only the gate selected, even though, again, technically that line right there would be clickable. And another way to use the lasso is you can uh, start to select a piece of it, like maybe this far. Got that perfectly. Then hold Shift, and then select uh, the next piece over here. So as you shift and drag, you select more of the object. So however you want to do this, as accurately or precise as you want or not, you want to select pretty much just the gate. And we'll, we'll turn it into a symbol, F8, in a moment. What I'm going to do is, in my case, I'm going to press F4 to kind of close every other panel to kind of get it out of my way. I'm going to use the lasso tool, and I'll use the pen tablet. The pen tablet is going to help me a lot to try to draw that lasso shape around the door. Thought I turned touch off. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna go in and try to select as best as possible just the gate. So I will shift to select more. So I'm fine here. Whoops, I missed seven pixels. I'm fine with that. So uh, you want to, to select your gate. Actually, then over here, I missed this. Select your gate, F6, or uh, sorry, F8. F8 to turn it into a symbol and registration centered, and we'll call this gate MC. Actually, MC gate? How are we calling these things? Um, MC gate, MC first. OK, yeah. So MC gate. Technically, the names could be anything you want, but pays to have some sort, of, some sort of consistency. So select your gate, turn it into a symbol. We'll give it an instance name, the instance name that we were referencing in the code. Then we'll write the. Then we'll, then we'll be able to animate it and then write further code for moving us from one scene to another.
Okay, so I'm turning that into a symbol. I want to um, give the symbol an instance name. So after you've turned it to a symbol, you select it in your properties. We were using BTN gate. This is the part that I see a lot of people do this so creatively, it's so cool. When you create something as a movie clip, it then has its own timeline, meaning it can animate and do its own thing and have its own music independent of other things that happen on screen. So I've got only one frame in this uh, scene, but the gate could have multiple frames of animation and sound and all of that. So once I've turned that into a symbol, you want to double-click the object. And then recall that when you double-click, that then on the top left corner shows you, you're editing that symbol. If I read it from right to left, I'm editing the symbol, which is inside of that scene. And then I can press back to go back. But now we've got a whole timeline of this symbol. And notice everything else is faded out to show you're not editing the main timeline. You're editing this symbol. Here then, uh, we can be as complex as we, we want for animating this. We can use a motion tween to rotate it. We can do it frame by frame, whatever. I'm going to keep it pretty simple that it's just going to be closed at one frame and then open at another. And then we'll add music also to give it the full effect. So the way I want to do this is um, frame 1, the door will be closed like this. Frame 10. Uh, I'll press F6 to duplicate that frame. And then with my uh, free transform tool, I can then maybe let's see, move the registration point over here and then rotate it over here. All right? If you when you when you use your free transform tool you've got that center registration point where it rotates from, right? So if you grab that rotation point and put it on the right side, that can be where it rotates from. So frame 10, I'll maybe move it over here. The perspective perhaps is that it's um, kind of starting to rotate. Then I go to frame. 15, F6, move it more to the right. Now also again, depending how you drew it, my gate is falling off of the hinges. Well, that's fine because um, I drew this super freehand. Um, just simply rotating it is not going to, <clears throat> is not going to um, account for those sorts of things. So you can uh, be as complex with that as, as you want. Maybe I'll rotate it a little bit. OK, that sort of still looks like it's kind of on the hinges. So here, just a simple three frame animation in that the first frame is open, and then the second frame is halfway opening up, and then the third frame, it's opened. Yeah, there's a lot of detail for me to fix, such as here, the lock is still attached to the wall, and then I've got these extra things floating around here. Well, the thing with that that I'll say is, well, I'm not the one trying to get a grade. So you are, so, so that means you will be fixing that. I'm fine with that. That's going to open up. So the gate has its own, if I, if I test this, the gate has its own animation. The gate is a button that is clickable. I'm going to run this on my device to see what it looks like so far. So I've got it on my tablet. I'm going to go to play. Hmm. The gate is opening and closing on its own. The specters are trying to get out. Well, again, it's got its own timeline. And when we had different frames in different scenes, remember everything plays automatically. We had to put a stop command on the different scenes. 
guess what? We're going to need a stop command on the timeline of the gate as well, or else here it looks like it's opening and closing. That's part of the point of having our code say, on the event of clicking the gate, play the gate animation. After I click the gate, I want it to animate open, not while I'm looking at it. If I were looking at a gate opening and closing like that, I wouldn't even walk in. I already know there's specters there. So the point of that is we need an actions layer inside of our gate, MC gate, and inside of that actions frame, a stop command. So you can create you can create a brand new actions layer in your movie clips, like the door here, the gate. Frame one, stop command so that the door doesn't open and close on its own. Okay, so having the stop action on frame one of the gate prevents the gate from opening automatically. Thinking about it, because I already know how this is going to go, thinking about it, you're going to click the gate, it's going to open up, play a sound, and then we walk inside. Remember, this happens at 24 frames per second. And in my case, when I was testing it here on my device, this is playing and replaying over and over and over. And when it gets to the final frame where it's open, it plays again, closed, opens, close, close, open, close. We're going to need a stop command also at the end of the animation of it opening up. I want it to be stopped before they open it, click to open it, it opens up, stops on that open frame for a moment, and then we proceed. So let's add a new keyframe on frame, um, frame um, 15. New, a new keyframe, so F7 on frame 15, and that needs a stop command as well. So frame 1, the door is closed, stop. Frame 15, the door is open, but stop that at that point too. And then what we've got is a door that's open and closed on both those frames. Furthermore, we want to then move us to scene one door. So after we stop playing the animation, next line here, movie clip dot go to and play. So we've seen this before. This is our code to move from scene to scene. This dot root. Go to frame one of our door scene in quotes, which is called S1 door. So now if I test it, so now if I test the project, it should behave a little bit more how I want in that once I get to the door scene, it doesn't open by itself. I tap the door or the gate, I tap the gate, 
uh, it animates for a moment, opening up, and then after that, it then takes us to scene one door. In my case, I think it's still a little too fast. So testing here, I should have a little bit more testing it here. Um, because we stop at this point, but then we go to the next scene, probably what will work better is if we have the code happening later on, like frame 25. You can you can just drag that frame 15 to 25. So I did that change. I dragged the frame 15 of actions to frame 25. It automatically then gave me some time, some F5 between 15 and 25. I, I then had to extend the frame for the opened door from 15 to 25. And so what we've got there is now a little bit more breathing room to actually see that the gate did open up and stayed closed for a moment. And then the code uh, takes us over to scene one door. So these are those little tweaks that maybe yours worked fine the way I had it a moment ago and you're fine with it or maybe you'd like to change it to make it behave uh, in a way that you like better. Maybe you want it to pause to be opened a little longer so you would just have the actions panel uh, the actions frame further out. So in my case I've got play, I'm on the gate scene, uh, it doesn't automatically open, I tap it to open, I get a little animation of opening, and then it stops. I think it might still be a little too too fast, so I can go back and tweak the time a bit more, and anyway then I get to the um, the main door. So I think in my case I will move frame 25 to uh, 35 and then extend also the visibility of the opened gate. All right, so did that work for you? Is your gate opening up? Anyone need a little help with that? Okay, so there's the example here of one of the things that will start to confuse our users. We have a plain old door on S1 door, and they'll think, okay, I'll click the door. I'll just open the door and get in. So we'll set up the door to be clickable, but it won't actually go anywhere. But what will happen is that the door will animate. Maybe the door will rattle, maybe we will play a sound but the door is not going to let us go through. However, it's an interactive thing. Just like the gate was interactive, what did it need? It needed to be turned into a symbol, it needed an instance name, and it needed the event listener to run a function to do something. We're going to need those exact same things for the door, although the something that it's going to do is it's not going to go to the next scene, it's going to animate or do something. So this time I'll do it backwards. I'll turn my door into a symbol, give it the instance name, then I'll write the code. Whereas for the gate, we wrote the code, then turned it to a symbol. So either or that you want to do. So same thing here. You want to select uh, what your door is to turn it into a symbol. Again, I drew it a little bit cockeyed here. So I'm going to need to use my lasso tool. Use my lasso tool to select my object.
Once I've selected the object, I need to convert it into a symbol, F8. MC front door. So MC front door, it's a symbol now. Needs an instance name. BTN door, BTN front door. So that's going to be that's going to have then an instance name. It's going to be similar to the gate in that it'll have some animation. I've created that uh, object so you can double click it to edit it. That'll take us into the world of that uh, object with its own timeline. Right away we know here to create an actions layer. There's going to be some animation happening here. We don't want this to happen all on its own, so actions layer with a stop command. Okay, so the point of this is here's where you can get creative in terms of someone's going to tap the, try to open the door, so I'm going to have my door shake. Uh, it's locked, it's going to shake, and then it's going to play a sound later. So I'll go to frame 5, F6, and I'll do something to my door, maybe like kind of rotate it a little bit like that. I'll jump over a couple frames, uh, frame um, 8, F6 that, then rotate it maybe the opposite way, jump over a couple more frames, F6, have it rotate again but maybe grow, a couple frames over F6, rotate back and grow also, maybe shrink actually. So I'm just putting together a few frames that once I play them, the, the door wiggles. So animation of course is changing, uh, changing visual elements and here you can get a, a simple little kind of wiggling effect here, just rotating a little to the right, little to the left, growing it, shrinking it a little bit. And notice the way I'm doing this is every two frames, I've got your, you've got your main frame, normal door, and then I jumped over here to 5, two, jump two frames over, F6, change it, two more frames, F6, change it, and then the final, final one there. And then so that's going to rotate, it's going to wiggle. That'll then automatically loop back to frame 1 and stop. So we don't have to do anything special there, because remember, a timeline plays, when it gets to the end, it starts over. So once we click the door, uh, we'll get past that stop command, it'll wiggle, and then it'll come back to the automatic frame one, and then it'll stop. So I've got that door that'll wiggle and then go back to normal. If I go back to scene one door, and now we can write the action script for this. 
So to head off any errors, confirm that your door has an instance name. I'll go back to my actions panel. I'm going to need to set up for that door to be clicked on um, and then run a function on the event of being clicked. BTN front door dot add event listener as usual. The event that we're paying attention to is a touch event dot touch tap. Touch tap comma, then we run a function. We'll just call this front door. The front door function will run once we tap the front door. See the logic of this. So next line we define that function. Parentheses void curly braces. Note that that's the end of our front door function. This runs from an event of touch event. This is the example again when I let it autocorrect me. It did the import at the beginning, which you can keep or not. And similar to what we did with the gate, we, we just play the timeline of, of the gate. Right now it's paused on stop. So we'll say for that front door, play it. That will then make the front door wiggle. It'll skip frame one, do its frames to frame 15 or whatever I have. It loops back to frame one automatically and stops. The person said, well, what was that? Then they tap the door again, it wiggles again. It'll never open up. You could, of course, program it that after a certain number of trying to open it, it then, op it then opens. Well, that'll be a conditional statement, which we'll get to a little later. So. We will enhance the app a little later about what if a person tries to do something twice, three times, then get a different result. We're going to do that with like the painting in the house. Remember, you try to grab the painting, nothing happens. They try again, then it breaks. So we can set up a condition. On the condition of trying to open the door or trying to move the painting two times, something else happens. That should be all we need for the door. There is a ghost in the room. You don't want me to go into the house. So I'm gonna oops, I'm gonna run that in my what did I do here? I close the whole thing. Okay, so I'm gonna run that in uh, my device and see what happens. I'm gonna try to tap the the door, and there should be a reaction that it wiggles. No errors. If you're getting any errors, call us over, of course. We don't want your errors to keep adding up. All right, so it's on my tablet. Play, there's my gate. My gate has worked before I tap that opens up. I'm on the front door, I press the door, wiggles. Press it again, wiggles. Goes back to the first frame because of the stop command to, after playing, goes back. That's fun. Okay, so anyone need a little help? Is any, is it, uh, let me put my code back up here and check what you've got.
You need this code. Wait, just rename it then. 
to the house so at this point um, we've got this uh, red herring in terms of I press the, the door and nothing happens it just wiggles later on we'll have some music so that it does a little bit more so guys we're doing the lecture now please so uh, here now comes the point where we've got to have some hit detection in terms of I've got a window and I've got a rock at the window that I'm gonna throw at the window so both of those need to be symbols they both need to have instance names and then we will set it up that instead of now a tap we're gonna have a tap and drag we're gonna be able to pick up that rock or stick or whatever yours is we're gonna be able to pick it up and move it better yet once we move it and have that object touch another object, hit detection, then something else will happen. Uh, play a sound, change the, change the animation of that uh, window that now it's broken, and then it'll take us to the next scene. So something's new and something's old. So what we need to do is uh, first turn these into symbols. We're going to have a symbol for the for the window and a symbol for that rock. So I'm going to select my rock and turn that into a symbol, F8, calling it MC Rock. Now 10 points if you turn that into a, if you drew a hammer instead. No one gets it. Okay, no problem. So um, I'm going to turn that into uh, a symbol, MC Rock. What's that? I would lose. Oh, I would. I would go bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> so that rock is now going to become a symbol, MC Rock. That window there needs to become a symbol here. I'm going to keep it super simple. I'm not going to worry about selecting only the white clickable area. I'm going to turn the whole thing into a symbol. So yeah, technically, if the rock touches that the window sill, it'll break it. I'm fine with that. After all, I'm not the one trying to get the grade. So I'm going to turn that into a symbol. F8, that'll be MC window right. I could further do stuff on the left window if I wanted, but I'm just going to focus on the right window. And both of them are symbols. Both of them are symbols. Both of them need instance names. Now we've been using BTN for things that are buttons that you click on. I could keep using that same prefix for these, btn rock, btn window right, if I want. Um, I can prefix them or name them however I want. With the rock, I'm going to call it obj for object, rock. It's an object I'm going to work with. Therefore, the right window, another object, obj window right. So a lot of people would call it OBJ right window. In a sort of a logic way of things, it's often a better idea to sort of, when you name things, name the main kind of thing it is first, and then the variation of what it is. Because I'm going to have perhaps a window right and a window left. When I see my code and have it alphabetized, well, everything that is a right thing will be 
alphabetized, and everything that is a left thing will be alphabetized. So when uh, I alphabetize it via what kind of object it is, window, all window objects will be grouped together instead of all right things, which may not make sense. Okay, so both of these have, the, both of them are symbols, both of them have instance names. Let's go to our actions panel. Let's open up our action script. This one's going to be different in terms of we had touch tap. So when you tap it, do something. When you tap it, do something. Now we're going to have in the event of tapping it to start to move it, in the event of letting it go, stop moving it. What's that? I'm in the S1 door, the main action script, okay. not in a symbol. Okay, so the name of my object, right? OBJ rock. Dot add event listener. A touch event. Dot. This time, however, a touch underscore begin. Comma, do something. I'll name that in a moment. I'm going to copy the exact code and paste it. But then touch end. And then do something else. This is something brand new. We'll make a note here. To set up a touch and drag result, we need to pay attention to when we begin touching the object and when we end touching the object. And we run a function for each, each event. So we, again, the, this is what people that are not used to programming when when we use an app or a game or a website or anything it's so easy I click it I drag it I, it does it I right click it does it when we program this we see that a lot goes on behind the scenes even from the most basic thing when I press my button on my phone some code on you know add event listener power button runs a function then dragging up to try to unlock my phone, add event listener, you know, touch begin, and when I start to type my password, one, two, three, four, five, it'll keep track of all of that and and do a result. So just to show you here, that's over and over what we see here from uh, from code. We have to be in charge of every single aspect of everything. Okay, we're going to run a couple of, of functions here. What happens is we, as we start to move the object and we finish moving the object. So fn rock move start and fn rock move end. Again, the naming of these things. fn, because it's a function. This is a function related to a rock. So rock is next. This is a function related to moving the rock. And this is a function that either deals with starting or ending. Maybe to make it more obvious, let's call it begin, just to kind of line up with the type of event. Touch begin, touch end. Move begin, move end. So then we need to define each of those functions. So function. This is one of the cases, I, I haven't mentioned it very, very much, but this is one of the cases where we don't have a curly brace at the end of our function. Um, if you add a curly brace, I believe it works fine, but it's best practice not to put an ending curly brace at the end of a function for some reason. But that's what we're doing, uh, our ending note. And then I need here the move end.
So the idea is the rock move begin function starts to run the moment we've touched and started to move the object. When we let go of the object, then the rock move end function will run. Um, we have to define also what are the boundaries, where can we move the object. At the moment, I want to be able to move it anywhere on screen. I want to pick up the rock and be able to move it anywhere. I could set my boundaries to only allow this to be moved into certain areas of my screen. That might be a way to make it easier for your users. Only let me move the rock on the right side of the screen, perhaps. We're going to set it up that they can move the rock anywhere they want. So before the functions, define our move boundaries. Meaning define to where on screen can we move our, our, our rock. So this will require a variable. We'll call this rock boundaries. Rock boundaries, colon rectangle. It's going to be a rectangle where they can move around. And well, that's what I've got here on my device. It's a rectangle. It can be defined as a circle, or a square, or a triangle, or a polygon. But I'm keeping it simple that it's the rectangle of the whole device. Let me say new space rectangle, capital R. Parentheses. Now, before I close the parentheses, it's popping up to tell me a rectangle is defined by x and y coordinates. Where does it start? And then the width and the height of the rectangle. So these are numbers that will define a rectangle. So we'll say 0, comma, 0, comma, stage dot stage width. comma stage dot stage height define our boundaries start at the top left corner of our game which is zero zero and define a rectangle All right, uh, everyone that's getting help, uh, if you guys could be a little quieter so we don't distract everyone else that's paying attention to the lecture, please. Start at the top left corner of our game, 00, zero and define a rectangle that is the width and the height of the stage or the project. The, uh, the canvas, you know, the screen. That's what the, parent that's what the values in the parentheses of rectangle are saying. So basically we're saying this rock has boundaries, like we all do. And it can, it's, it's defined by a rectangle. And the boundaries of that rectangle are, we're going to define a new rectangle, which starts at the top left corner of the screen, 0, 0. And is then wide enough that is the stage, and tall enough, that is the stage. So if you wanted to change where your, where your movable area of your object is, you need to define where in x and y coordinates to start off with. So if I wanted this rock to only be movable in this bottom left corner, I need to open up my x and y coordinate panel and figure out where is this top left corner right here. Let's say you know, it's somewhere like 300 to the right and 500 down. And then I need to define how much to the width, let's say 200 pixels, and how much down, let's say 400 pixels, just picking values. So if I wanted this rock to only be movable in that little corner, that's what I have to define here within the 
within the parentheses. This, the way we've got it here, is everywhere on screen. Starting from the top left corner, as wide as the stage, as tall as the stage. So if you need to change that if you want to for your own game, that's how you can do that. You can, of course, ask uh, for help during the lab, and we'll figure out your exact coordinates. But that's the idea of what that is. So therefore, when we begin moving our object, we have to adhere to those boundaries, to those coordinates. So the touch uh, this rock move begin, uh, let's not forget here, parentheses, event, colon, touch event. This function only runs based on a touch event. We'll say, as I move my rock only, allow it to be moved within the boundaries from line 20. Now the problem with putting notes in here that specify a line number is that you may change your lines, add or remove, and then your line numbers don't line up anymore. So we will say event.target dot start touch drag parentheses so we're saying whenever we begin to move an object an event is happening let's deal with the with the target, what what the thing it is that we're moving, and uh, what will happen here is follow the the boundaries. Uh, so event dot touch point capital P ID all in capitals comma false comma the rock boundaries. So basically, that's that's the that's the code, the details of what it's actually saying. It's sort of like, don't worry about it, but it has to be this this code. The important part is right there: rock boundaries. We created on line twenty a variable that defines where the object can be moved. All of the rest of it is just boilerplate. You have to have that. And basically, we're saying this object, this rock, can only be moved within these boundaries. That's what all of that complex thing is 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 doing. So. That's what that function's about. OK, then we need to work on the move end. <clears throat> We're moving the object. Once we let it go, it has to check, is this object touching this object? If not, nothing happens. If the object is touching the other object, then something else happens, moving us to the next scene. So we will say, actually, uh, we can uh, copy and paste here. If you copy event.target. If you, if you copy event.target.startTouchDrag, event.touchID. If you copy that part but nothing else, we can just reuse that and then change it a little bit. The code is, is similar, uh, except it does not have to care about boundaries. Once you let go of the object, it doesn't have to check boundaries. It knows that when you move it, it can only be within the boundaries. So I'm just copying that exactly as it is. And then we end the parenthesis and the semicolon. The important part is right here. I'll say conditional statement to check if the rock touched the window.
A conditional statement is an if parentheses curly brace else parentheses curly brace. And we can note and if else for checking hit detection. That's what this if else is about. Conditional statement to check if the rock touched the window. It's hit detection. So what will happen either is yes, one object touched another object, or no, it didn't. Rock did touch window, or else rock did not touch window. So a conditional statement on the condition that something happens or doesn't happen, either I got the high score, or I didn't. Either I still have seven lives, or I don't. Either the rock touched the window, or it didn't. If else. If it's true that the rock touched the window, play the animation that breaks the window and move me to the next scene, or else um, don't do anything, because I didn't break the window. Well, the if that we're checking is going to be right here. The name of the object trying to touch the other object. Uh, so we have MC Rock dot hit test capital T object capital O parentheses. Now be careful here. People lose track of this easily. There are two parentheses here because those parentheses go with the command hit test object. People can lose track of it like this, and they write hit test object parentheses. Nope, that's not correct, because this parenthesis now is closing hit test object, but then the opening of if is lost. So make sure you've got two parentheses right there. One parenthesis. Yes? Question, is it MC rock or object rock? It is object rock, yep. It was MC rock in the name in the Library, yes, sorry about that. Object Rock, <clears throat> our instance name. Well, that, that would have been also a good learning experience for me to get an error, and then we can troubleshoot what happened. But <laughs> we might as well head that off. <laughs> we might as well head that off. So yes, it's OBJ. It's an object, the rock object. We're going to run a command, hit test object. It's going to check true or false. Did this object touch that object? Well, the object in question then is OBJ window, OBJ window right in the parentheses. OBJ window right. So two things are happening. Inside of the parentheses, we've got its own command that is it test if this object touched that object. That would do its own thing and give back the result of true or false. Well, then that's inside of if. If what you're testing for is a true, we do the code in this block. It did touch the window. Or else, when the hit test object method runs and that returns a false, it automatically then takes us to the else part, did not touch. And what we want to happen with a with a true, which we haven't fully set up yet, and we'll do that, and that'll be the last thing for the day, is we have the obj window write object dot play, just like we had the gate. When we tick, when we click the gate, we played the gate. It animated. It took us to the door. Well, here the window will take us to the hallway when the rock touches the window the window movie will play it will have code that then takes us to the hallway it will have animation that shows the window breaking 
it will have a sound that the window's breaking, and it will have code that takes us from scene gate to scene hallway. So in, we need to now then finish the code for the day by editing the, um, the, the, the window, the OBJ window. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to double click my window to edit the window. I need a layer for actions here. I need a stop command because or else the window's going to uh, the window's going to break over and over and over and over just like that uh, gate was opening and closing over and over. Once you've got a timeline in an object, it will play automatically infinitely unless you stop it. So I want it to stop here. Frame 5 F6. I will draw the window slightly broken. Jump over two frames later, F6. Draw it a little bit more broken. Jump over two more frames, F6. Draw it even more, a little bit broken. So we're going to break it in a few frames. Let's see, how do I draw a broken window here? Let's see. I'm going to first select. Select a part of it inside of there and start to draw some cracks. Jump over two frames, F6, and draw it more broken. Jump over two more frames, draw it even more broken, as much as you want. Now, thinking outside the box, you could draw the, the shards of glass on the ground. Uh, we had originally drawn the the window as being on the wall, and that was the object. But you are free to draw anything outside of what you originally drew, because then here when I animate it, that's what I get. It's going to open up and the glass went somewhere. Some inside, some outside. You can draw more of the pieces on the ground in the other frames. I just put them on the final frame. And similar to the gate, after it opened up, I needed to pause it for a while. I think we went up to 35, so frame 35, F5. So a few frames of animating it broken, pausing for a while to frame 35. I can add more time, less time, depending when I play it, how much it feels. But then just, just like the, the gate, after it does its animation, it then takes us to the next scene. So we need a blank keyframe in the Actions panel, frame 35. And we need to uh, write our code here to take us to move us to the hallway. So frame 35 of the actions, layer F7, some new code. Open up the actions panel. You can copy and paste, or I'll just write it here. Um, we've got the usual code here for moving. Movie clip, parentheses, dot go to and play, parentheses. We've got this dot root. It's going to take us and play us to frame 1, 
comma, quotes of the name of your scene. Mine is called a uh, scene to hall. This should be enough for the moment. Let me test my code if there's any errors. There's a little error. OK, let me check what that is first. Access of undefined property event in my case here. So what's this? Oh, here, here it is here. Super easy to forget, which I did. In my case, it's saying, what's this event? I don't know what this event is here. Well, I forgot to put something in the parentheses. Notice how almost every function we create has something in the parentheses. We use this function based on a certain event. Uh, that's probably event touch event, but let me confirm that. Um, yeah, same thing. So I left the parentheses blank on line 27 of my FN Rock movie end. That should be also event colon touch event. Just like above there, that the FN Rock move begin is based on an event of a touch event. The rock move end is also that. So it was giving me an error on line 28. And the frustrating thing is, I'm looking at my code. I spelled that properly. Well, that wasn't quite a, you know, a syntax error. That was a bit of a logic error. And that it's saying, well, what event do you mean? We're going to start to drag something based on an event. Well, what event? That event would come from right here, which we forgot to put. So. Adding it in here now knows, well, this event is based on that, which is based on starting to drag the object. Hopefully then no more errors there. Yep, no more errors. So it's covering there. Sorry about that. I'll move it in a moment. But check if your code is, is wrong. If mine works, we'll end the lecture in just a moment. We'll have some final lab time for the other game. But let me confirm mine. I want to break some windows. It's coming up here. I press play. There's my gate. That opens up. Nice. Add some music later. Press the, press the door. It wiggles. We'll add sound to that later. You should be able to pick up the rock. I can drag the rock all over the place. Cool. Because the boundaries are all over. Now here, depending how you drew your object, your object may be too small to grab. So mine's the right size. Once I then put it on the window, there's going to be a hit detection, and it should break it. So there should be the detection of moving that object onto the other object. Actually, I just saw one thing here. Um, if it doesn't actually detect it and break it, like mine, I missed a little thing right here. Mix, missed something right here. Uh, we have move begin, start, touch, drag. Move end, that shouldn't be start, touch, drag. Sorry, that should be stop, touch, drag. Very easy to lose track of that. But logically, OK, now that I wrote it properly, that makes sense. When we move, when we begin move the rock, we have the start touch drag. When we move end, when we stop moving the rock, we have stop touch drag. So that should then detect it. And then I think there's also a bug about the layer of things. We'll fix that next time. But I think that should do it. Let me check my own code. You should be able to move that rock and touch that other object. Once you let go, 
once you let go of the rock, it will then try to detect. It's not going to be that as soon as the rock touches the object, it detects it. No, when you let go of the rock touching the object, then it'll detect it. I think there's a way to detect it while you're actually moving it to check if it touched. But we're, we're doing it in terms of after letting go of the rock to detect. Let's see, play, open gate, move the object onto the rock. There's the bug about the object going behind the object. We'll get to that next time. Hmm. Did that work for you? Did, did it break the window? So did anyone check if it worked? Are you able to break the window? In any event, I'm going to end the lecture at this point. If it did break the window, great. If it didn't, we'll continue it next time. <clears throat> I want to give the final hour and 15 minutes to work on the Tap Frenzy game. So it worked. Great. So I'm going to s you went to the next scene. Great. I'm going to save that. Uh, I'm going to put a copy of my code into the network folder up to this point. I'll put the copy of this code into Canvas if you want it also. You can double check the lecture if you want to replay it. We'll do some lab time now until 4 for you to finish your tap frenzy.